Tradina, episode 55. Because the market is going to use these levels as support and resistance. The market's going to do something. Your job is not to fight it. The market never, ever runs away. It's always there. That personal diary of trading will make you a much better trader than... I could be right about the direction, but wrong about the trade. Don't focus on the monetary side. Trying to make too much money on a trade is what I have seen killed every trader. Your losses offer you some of the greatest insight you can find into your mistakes. Relax. Learn the process. Candlestick pattern trading is a freaking trap. Don't be in a rush to become a millionaire. Let the market tell you what the market wants to tell you. This podcast is not financial, trading, or investing advice of any kind. What's up, traders? Welcome to another installment of the Trading Up Podcast. I'm your host, Cam Hawkins, and today we have Jody Samuels on the show. Now, Jody brings to us in the interview today a wealth of knowledge from her years at big institutions, trading floors at big institutions. In fact, so we talk trading forex so she was known as the queen of the quid she traded uh pound dollar pound which is known as cable uh, they gave her a nickname she was so good at it so guys we're going to get to hear all about her experiences there at the big institutions which a lot of us starting to think are the ones that well we know they move the markets but how much so and how how much do they actually affect what we do as retail traders? What are they thinking about? What are they looking at? You're going to find out a whole bunch of information that you may be able to apply to your trading in today's episode. Now, before we get into that, I do want to talk to you about a book I recently downloaded and listened to on Audible. Now, I've signed up to Audible, so I'm, I've gone through three books now. It's been quite good. I was only going to do the one book that I wanted, and then I thought, oh, this one looks interesting, and then another one looked interesting, of which I might drop in here in future episodes, so stay tuned for that. Um, This one was called The Courage to Be Disliked. Uh, really useful for all the people that are trolling me on online. So um, really good to, to get an understanding as to why they're doing that. And uh, and what I found was there's something in the book, which isn't really related to trading, but it might be, well, there's a couple of things that might be of use for you in your life. So number one is, uh, it's all about task, uh, separation of tasks is what they call it. And before I talk about that, the whole book, which is the other interesting thing, is based on this Adlerian psychology. So if you've never heard of that and you want to understand what it's all about, then I do recommend checking out the book because it just gives you a completely different way of looking at everything to do with life, basically. And a different, I suppose, a different psychological way of looking at it, which when you think about trading and how it all relates back to trading mindset, this could be something that may help alter your mindset to help you become a better trader. Um, so anyway, the one thing that I suppose I'm going to mention today is separation of tasks. And separation of tasks, what this, I had to listen to it twice, what this means is really just thinking about the goal of the other person. So what is the other person's goal? Uh, and in your, I suppose if we do relate it back to trading, if you look at the markets, what is the goal of the other person? The goal of the other person may be to win the trade, or the goal of the other person may be to um, fake out your trade so that it can get the, they, they can get their orders on to then take the market in their direction or get a better price. So there's a whole bunch of goals that everyone else is, is uh is trying and and we ourselves have these goals that we're trying to achieve and we try and we I suppose portray those goals via what we say what we do our, essentially our personality so if you do something or say something there is a goal at the end of it you may not know what that goal is but there is definitely a goal and usually you've got to think long and hard to work out what that real goal is so I don't know if I'm just rambling on here, guys. If you find it useful, you might do. I'm going to stop because I don't want to keep going on about it. I do recommend if you want to find out exactly how it all works, then head over to, um, I mean, you can go to Audible, you go to Amazon, whatever you want to do, and check out the link to that or check out that book. It's called The Courage to Be Disliked. Maybe it's going to be useful, maybe not. All right, guys, enough from me. Let's just head into this interview and, um, and check it out. All right, folks, we've got Jody Samuels here from Forex or FX Traders Edge.com. Jody, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm great, Cam. Thanks for having me on your show. This is well, terrific. 
I know it's taken us a while to get here, so it's, it's really it's really a pleasure to have you on. Um, so today we're going to go through a few things um, about your sort of trading journey, and I want to start off with where it all started. So do you want to take us back to, to how you got into trading? Oh, sure. Oh, boy, that's taking me way, way back. Okay. You know, I, I went to uh, business school as an undergraduate. I, I went to the Wharton Business School, at, you know, at Penn in Philadelphia, and I was a member of um, this business organization, which, well, called ISEC, and ISEC created internships for students to work abroad. So one year I was the president of ISEC, and we did a really good job at creating job opportunities in the Philadelphia area for foreign students. And in turn, we got to send a bunch of our students abroad. So my internship took me to Bergen, Norway, in the arbitrage department of a Bergen bank, where they traded, the arbitrage department is the foreign exchange department, where they traded all of the Scandinavian currencies the Norwegian kroner, the Swedish kroner, the Danish kroner. And I was witness to that. Um, and, and at that point, I, I had already accepted a job with a manufacturing firm in California. And I had accepted that position because, you know, during our senior year, we interviewed. And that would have been more along the lines of, I think, cost accounting. <laughs> And after this internship, I said, wait a second, I think I need to change course immediately. <laughs> and I did. I actually, well, yeah, I did. I, I actually went back to New York after my three and a half month stint in Norway. I traveled around Europe also for like a couple of weeks. And I knocked on two doors, two major banks, two major international global banks. And I got the job at J.P. Morgan in the foreign exchange department. So as a, as a trader. And so what was, what was it that, uh, I suppose swayed you in making that massive sort of career shift, uh, when you went to Norway, what, what were you seeing? And I mean, take us inside that, that organization and what you were seeing. Well, there was this great guy there who was very versed in economics and he, re- and he spoke English very, very well. And he taught me a lot of, economics and how that um, affected the the currency movements. And I had already taken some international economics courses at Penn. So it it just sort of, I don't know, it just sort of um, made me more aware of the global markets, the global foreign exchange markets, and how the stuff that I studied applied to it. And I just, I loved it. I loved it. I think the thing about taking a, getting the job in the, you know, with the manufacturing company was more about just getting my first job. It was less about what I really wanted to do, what I was passionate about. I really didn't know what I wanted to do when I was told just get a job that seems good. And I honestly, I thought it was a cool idea to work out in California. So it wasn't that I was really passionate about the job itself. I think I was more passionate about moving away from the East Coast and going out to California. Righty ho. Okay. And so, so you moved to J.P. Morgan. You got a job at J.P. Morgan. What was that like? Mm. Well, it was. I mean, that was my career. I didn't move around. Like I know a lot of people have moved around over the years, but that was my trading career at JP Morgan. I loved working at JP Morgan. A fine, you know, at that time it that was before Chase, before, you know, it was it was like at the beginning part of the foreign exchange markets. The markets, let's see, they uh the bank started getting involved in the 1970s, so I started in 1980, a long time ago. So that was the early stages. Uh, they had already created a whole trading team, and I joined the trading team. But the training was more or less going through the bank training program and also really learning on the flight, sitting down and being the assistant trader with a trader. And I don't know if I should say this, but my first experience wasn't the best experience. I was with a trader who really wore his emotions on his sleeve and I got the brunt of his emotions when trading didn't go so well. So 
I was a pretty sensitive woman and I didn't take it so well. Um, but the, the chief dealer, the manager, um, quickly, you know, put, put someone else on that currency who was just such an amazing trader. And I got to work with him and I got to learn from the best, uh, really the best tops, tops. And it, it ended up being such a great experience for me. And then um, I was, I worked with him for a little over a year and then he left, he, he moved banks and I was given the, you know, the position to trade. Yeah. And, and what were they, what were they like, what are the things that this guy was able to teach you? Oh, just everything about trading. I just, uh, I'm just trying to remember. It, Okay, the most important thing was that he made money consistently. And I was able to map that in my brain and really understand how to do it. I, there are just so many you know, tricks to um, learning about price action and, and learning about, at that time, we had squawk boxes. So the banks were uh, transacting over squawk boxes with brokers. Like you literally had to transact with brokers. We did have... Um, the ability to call other banks and ask them for prices over the phone and we would deal over over the phone. So I would say, hey, like I was able to uh, model my trading after his. He was a great mentor. And I think that's what's so important, you know, for today to be able to find a mentor who is successful, who does make money trading, who can really show you what they're doing. So I, I, I while working with this guy, I was able to just learn from the best and and I was able to fortunately um, make it my own and do it myself and yeah back then back then were you like looking at price charts all day or was it more um, ticker feeds or, or something like, to that effect yeah so we collected our own data um, but it wasn't we didn't have our price charts ready like we collected our own data we probably got our own data in the form of charts a few years later. So we did not look at um, price charts all day long at the very beginning. We didn't. It was more, well, actually, we did look at price charts from the IMM, the International Monetary Market, so the futures markets, because there was a futures market at the time and we could, you know, call up data. But we had Reuters and Tellerate and we could get, charts but not like today like in the beginning like in the first couple years of when i started no i really didn't look at charts all day long it was more um in the head and yes we and hearing the you know what we we gauged our prices by the brokers and by our books so it was more price action when you got I traded the British pound, by the way. I was I, I called the queen of the quid. I was the only female uh, British pound trader in the, from the major banks at the time. So when five banks would call me for cable prices and I would have to quote each one of them, I would have to just know, what, you know, I, I would find out quickly what was going on after the first quote and I would get, you know, taken or hit given pounds I would either be long or short and then I would just quote my price higher to the next person and if I still got taken then something some major news came out so it was more like working through the price action as an interbank trader Uh, that was just in the very early days but then of course we had obviously we had charts and we um we saw the prices on the on the Reuters screen, so and we saw on Tellerate. So we saw the prices in the market, and we heard them live through the brokers. So we knew where the market was, but the market really was where we said it was. So if the pound was being quoted ten twenty, I'm just quoting wide because the spreads. You know, if you we we tried to quote five pip spreads back then, um, on our you know on on the amount that we quoted, which was like three or five million pounds at a crack. So if I quoted 10, 20, let's say, and somebody didn't deal, then that was the market. But if somebody dealt with me at 20 and then I was short at 20, if I thought nothing was going on, I might quote 18, 28 or 
1727. If I got paid again at 27 and the broker was still showing 1727 or 1525, whatever, I could quote 3040 or 4050. I made the market depending on you know how I want how I depending on my position and where I wanted to mm. be. That was it. So looking back, I mean, there were tremendous arbitrage opportunities if you could, uh, you know, get, we often did get quotes from different banks with, you know, somebody would be quoting 1020, somebody else would be quoting 3040, but it was difficult to, you really didn't want to hit the bid on one of the 30 and, and pay the 20 if you were one-sided yourself. Uh, interesting. So at that point, did you sort of feel that, you know, because JP Morgan, I suspect, was a major, major bank. And, I mean, were you making the market, like, for everyone else? And was there any type of, and I mean, you probably can't even answer this, but uh, manipulation going on, what you would have considered manipulation? No, absolutely not. I mean, not from my perspective. Uh, um, no, it, no. So there's guys in there, like, on a day in and day out basis that some would make money, some would lose money. And so it was like, they were in the same boat as everyone else really. Okay. The only type of manipulation is, was, I mean, sometimes if you got wind of some news maybe before other people did, like if, if you knew that an announcement was being made from your organization, you should have had that information, but sometimes you did. Like I, I certainly didn't at JP Morgan. They certainly didn't tell us things that were they were going to broadcast to the market. But like there were some economists that worked for different organizations, and I can't confirm this, but if they knew that the economist who was very well renowned was going to say something, then they could just, you know, or, or let's say it just came out and you hadn't seen the news yet. Like that's just say it that way, then you, you could get caught off guard. Is that manipulation? No, it's just, um, you, you, you know, you got caught and that was it. Okay. That's interesting. And so, so how did you, how did things progress from there? So how many years were you at JP and then what happened afterwards? Yeah. So I was there for 14 years and I was, Brought to, sent to Canada to be able to manage a desk in Canada. That was a promotion to be able to, you know, manage a profit center. And, you know, I, on the desk in New York, I was I was um, a dealer, and then I was assistant chief dealer, and then they moved me to Canada as, to be a manager and be responsible for a whole profit center. So that was my career at J.P. Morgan, and it was a wonderful career. I worked with, you know, many many top traders. And when I left the bank, I set up a trading desk on my own, um, and I traded futures markets for two years. But I really felt that, I, you know, I, I had to think, what am I going to do? Because that was in the uh, mid-90s, and the retail market hadn't started yet. And so I attended these uh, Las Vegas trading shows because I wanted to learn from other mentors. I wanted to learn from people who were on their own. I mean, I was at a bank and and part of me felt that, gee, maybe I need to really learn a different way, a different style, because I don't have the same information that I had while working at the bank. But it was all in my head, of course. And so that's what I did. I began a whole process of like retraining myself and just picking up different skills, different, like learning about different indicators, because I, I didn't really use indicators. We used Elliott Wave Analysis at the bank and pivot points, and that was probably the extent of, I mean, we had the whole host of indicators, so we used moving averages, of course, but not any of the fancy stuff that, like, now they're just, you know, thousands upon thousands of indicators. Um, we used the basic ones. And but it was mainly price action and elite wave analysis that that I you know learned and so learned about so the um, the shift to futures from currencies yeah was that just purely because there was no retail market at the time that you could dive into yeah yeah exactly so I did futures and I actually learned when going to these uh, Las Vegas seminars I learned from like amazing people and uh, 
Bill Williams was one of my mentors, actually. I learned from him. I actually, um, there were a few of us that spent a week with him on our own, learning about the futures markets, because I felt that I had to, you know, really dive into the futures markets if I was going to trade them on my own. Yeah, I could have figured it out by myself, but it was much easier to work with the mentor and learn from that mentor and and then dive in, which is what I did. And that was the best decision that I made because it's just so much easier when you learn from an expert and then you can go back and, and do it yourself. And so you, you've you started off with Elliott Wave and that was taught at the bank. Uh, what was the What was different between what you learned there and what Bill was teaching you? I think I think what Bill was taught me was just how to I don't know um, how to have more confidence on my own and more about the futures markets and how to integrate the Elite Wave analysis in the um, with with trading you know money management trade management all that kind of stuff um, yeah because while while we were at the bank we actually hired you know a few analysts. Well, one analyst in particular off the floor of the Chicago Board of Trade, and he brought us the elite wave expertise and the pivot point expertise because he was a floor trader. So I learned from him and I learned, you know, he had us reading the Robert Prechter book and I read the, he didn't tell us to do it, but I just did it on my own uh, because I wanted to understand what he was talking about. And that came with me and that that I really uh, you know I that was uh, like it became a part of me I really saw the market cycles in a way that just made sense to me Uh, and and Bill stuff certainly um, you know at built on that knowledge but more you know I got the confidence in you know in trading on my own and I traded you know 20 different futures markets Coffee was one of my favorites, actually, at the time. And so, so you, you said you did that for a couple of years. Uh, how did that? How did that go? It went well. Um, I remember I I rented space in my husband's office, so we would go down together. We would ride our bicycles together <laughs> down to his office. It was it was a lot of fun. But I I, I was a little bit um, I don't know like. I didn't want to be by myself trading by myself anymore. I wanted to either like do something different. Like I, it was, uh, yeah, because trading at that time with no retail market with no, really no, I had no, um, conversations with anybody about the markets. I was just on my own, literally. So then I was given an opportunity actually to be a to work for an energy company and that was during the Enron days and I thought wow how cool is this I can learn about the electricity markets and be in on that you know what when the electricity markets are opening up in Toronto and I was given a tremendous opportunity to be part of that even though we all know what happened with Enron and with that uh, that whole venture it was still a great experience and I did learn about the energy markets and uh, that was, I was there for seven years. Wow. Yeah. On the, on the trading floor. So it was a fabulous experience. Mm-hmm. And, and after, after Enron, how did that, where did things pan out? So it's a long old career here. Yeah. So I left, I left cause I, I didn't want to stay anymore. And that's when I started FX Traders Edge decided to just go out on my own and start a, a trading and education company. And that's what I did. Nice. And that's, that's where I am now. Yeah. And so, so you got back into FX eventually, uh, obviously when the retail market was, was much more uh, established. How did that, how did that work out? Yeah, it, good. Really. It worked out really well. Um, were you, yes, were, were you, uh, did you have to retrain yourself because of the, I suppose, the additional data that was available and, uh, you know, the fact that all these retail traders had come into the market and uh, was it was it different from when you were trading the, the, the currencies at the, say, JP Morgan back in the day? 
Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so what was interesting was I joined this outfit um, as a retail trader, and I, I don't know what you had to pay to join. I don't know. And I, with the intention of, you know, maybe, I don't know, being a part of it and, and being able to t teach them and, and trade on my own. And so I joined this. Um, I think I saw them at a show. And I was in the trading room, and I, I could see some of the other mentors in the room discussing trading. And I was thinking to myself, oh, my gosh, there's one piece missing to this puzzle, and that's Elliott Wave Analysis. So I spoke to management, and I said, you know, I, I think I should do an Elliott Wave course to teach people because all these retail traders, like, really, they, they're missing a big piece of the, of the whole picture here. So they said, fine. So that's what I did. I put together, you talk about retraining. I, I created this whole Elite Wave program. So based on, you know, what I knew and what I didn't know, I just like put it together. And that was just so great for me. It was great for everyone. They, everybody embraced it. They loved it, loved it, loved it. And then, um, so that was like, you know, getting really getting back into Elite Wave analysis and teaching it while practicing it myself and, and learning about, yeah, it's still the Forex markets. And it, it was the re just because the retail market opened up, it really, it was the exact same thing that I was doing at the bank. Only I was trading on a different trading platform and I wasn't getting broker prices, you know, squawked at me through boxes. It's the exact same thing. I, it, I didn't have to adjust at all. And so, so you mentioned there that Elliott Wave was missing. I mean, I don't actually interview that many Elliott Wave traders out there, uh, that, on the show. Uh, not for the fact that you know um, uh, I don't want to. It's more the fact that there's just there's not that many of them when you when you find when you go out and find traders. I mean, how much how important do you think it is in today's market, and why why do you think Elliott Wave is is such a, a critical missing element to, to some trading strategies. Okay. As I, I like to uh, do a top-down approach when I trade, and I, I use the Elite Wave map analysis as the roadmap, like doing a top-down approach, so looking at the big picture and seeing what the big trend is. Elite Wave is just a question of understanding if we're in a trend market or a sideways market. And if we're in a trend market, then the trends move fairly quickly in markets like today, and you have to jump on board, and that's where you're going to make your most money. If we're in a sideways market, you don't want to get chopped up. So just having that clarity of where we are, and I'm not talking about the wave counts and having an exact wave count because I am not an Elliott Wave analyst in that sense. I can just look at a chart and tell you where we are if we're in a corrective mode or a trend mode and then trade accordingly. And we have a strategy uh, called the Wavy Tunnel Pro, and the strategy trades the Elliott Waves. But first you have to have a good sense of what the market cycles are, i.e. trend and, and corrections, and understand what the corrections might look like. So some are very simple and some are a little bit complex. So you just need that visual understanding you don't need to understand what the wave count is i don't need to understand that because i can take the wavy tunnel setup and see what and tell you what the a, a basic wave count is just from the looking at the strategy so that's why when people think about elite waves some people think about you know the wave counts and it's so complicated and yes, it can be. And especially now because the markets are mature. Don't forget when I started, we were on a clean slate and the markets were like at the, you know, in their infancy state. So that's why we had huge moves. And that brings up another uh, reflection that when I was trading at the bank, sometimes news would come out and the market would gap and we would be quoting 100 pips wide. Like, wow. honestly, 100 Jeez. pips wide, yeah. So I remember when I started in the retail market, the retail traders were squabbling about the pips that the brokers were quoting, and I would roll my eyes and think, you have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Five pips, that's good. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, look, yeah. people are saying now that it's going to be that you're actually going to go minus. You actually be making pips when you enter a trade. <laughs> like it's so yeah, big, yeah, so, yeah. So I know, I know. But at that time, you know, five pips is good. Now that's five pips is very wide. Well, it depends on the pair. But... Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Well, um, that that gives us a great insight into your history, and um, there's like lessons in there galore for everyone. Uh, what about? Today, I mean, how do things look? I mean, if if we sort of if we were going to pick up your, you know, look into your trading account, uh, how many pairs are you trading? So for that, I just want to tell you that we have a, a service, and the service reviews sixteen different uh, markets, and so those are more or less the markets that I'm that we are covering that I'm covering. Um, so it's a smattering of currencies and indices and gold and oil okay that those are the markets that we have decided to to cover and yeah and how many trades would be placed uh, in a week so we have a service like just to standardize it where we take one of our wavy tunnel setups and we we find trades so the the trades that are sent out to our, our members are probably, you know, one to two a week. That's all. And they're swing trades. Uh, and, and what, so those are documented trades. And so on those documented trades, I mean, what are the, what are the winning percentages and uh, risk to reward ratios? Yeah. You know, I do, I just tried to call it up. I don't have, um, okay. So the losing positions are 30 pips. That's it. The idea is that you want to take, you want to maximize your winning trades and minimize, maximize the size of your wins and minimize the size of your losses. So even if you have three losses in a row, when you have that next winning trade, it's going to more than compensate for the losses. So if I look at the last several trades, for example, the losses are 30 pips. That's the maximum. But if I look down the column of trades from this year alone, I can just, I'll just tell you, you know, what some of the wins have been. I, um, 240 pips, 100 pips, 100 pips. This is 60 pips, um, 30 pips, 130 pips, 330 pips, 96 pips, 40 pips, 200 pips, 310 pips. And, I, and, and mixed in, in with this is the minus 30 pips. So when you add that all up, in 2019, this uh, manual trading system is up 1,630 pips. Righty-ho. And in 2018, um, it made 3,048 pips. So that's, um, that's pretty good. Now, talking about pips doesn't really you know, mean anything. The reason why I'm not talking about returns is because you can, the return is, is really indivi- have up to the individual, right? If you trade, let's say just a $10,000 position, you don't need $10,000 in your account to trade that. But if you trade a $10,000 position, you might only have one, one or $2,000 in the account to trade that. Like with the leverage, you, you, do, you know, and depending on where you live, you don't need that much. So if you take the notional value of $10,000, it's a dollar a pip. So 1,630 pips is $1,630. But if you do a a hundred thousand dollar position, and again, you don't need a hundred thousand dollars to take that. And let's say you have ten thousand dollars in that account. So now we're you multiply the sixteen thirty by ten, so that's sixteen thousand three hundred dollars. And if you have ten thousand dollars in your account, will you do the math? Like you're you're saying, well, you made a um, hundred and sixty percent on your account. But if you if you look at the notional value, the hundred thousand dollars, you would say, well, I made sixteen percent. So that's why I have to qualify, you know, when I talk about returns and pips, et cetera, because of the leverage and what the size of the account is. And do you have any sort of interesting, or have you come across, or I suppose it's here, do you implement it in your own personal trading, any interesting sort of ways to, to do that, 
money management in terms of you, know, you could you could take it the simplistic you know as the examples you've given put a position on uh and let it you know either lose or win are there any sort of nifty ways that you've come up with or or seen in your travels uh of of entering those positions yes i this is what i use and this is what i've developed and this is what i teach my students it's called the three profiteers and i developed it because as a perfectionist, in quotes, I when the market moved my way and I would think, okay, should I get my, out of my position now? And I would get out of my position if I just took one position. And then I saw it go much more. I would be, you know, kicking myself for getting out of my position too soon. By the same token, because I only took one position, let's say, if it went, if it moved in my favor and I was in profit and then it would move against me, I wouldn't get out of it necessarily because it didn't move to my profit target. So I, I might end up losing money on that. So I decided, I came up with the three profiteers and that's uh, based on taking three positions for one trade idea and using the Fibonacci sequence for your profit targets. So if you do your Elliott Wave analysis and look at the wavy tunnel and see and, and look at the bigger time frame, take a position and, and come up with a level where you think it's going to go. And let's say you think it's going to be a 150 pip move, let's just say. That would be your potential profit area, like your 150 pips. So then you would work backwards along the Fibonacci sequence and, and the Fibonacci Number less than 150 is 144, and below that is 89, below that is 55. So you would take profits at 55, 89, and 144 pips. You'd set it up in your trading platform, and your stop loss would be 55 pips, and you would set it so that when the first profit target is met, so the 55 on one position, the um, the platform automatically moves you to break even it's called the trailing stop because you had your stop at you, you set your trailing stop at 55 you had your stop at minus 55 when it moves 55 in your favor you get profited out on one position and then your position moves to break even uh, and if the trade is right it's going to work and you know it's it's a beautiful it's wonderful and, and do you move that break even to into profit at any point? Like when it moves to say the the eighty nine level, would you move that to fifty five? Sometimes, yeah, that's the idea. That's what you would do. But then I would, yeah, that's that's the idea of that strategy exactly. Cool. Okay. And sometimes you just get stopped at you know stopped out before it moves the whole way because you know, but but that's okay. You made money. Now we're going to try. We're going to change the uh, the subject slightly. We w- I want to talk about cryptocurrency. So I saw in your Twitter feed that you've got a few videos out there about Bitcoin and stuff. I mean, what's your do you, a do you trade them in your? It didn't sound like it was in your portfolio of sixteen, but uh, do you trade them and do you, or do you have any views on on where they're going? Yeah, we do trade them. I mean, it's part of our, we have Bitcoin and Ethereum as part of our, it's, we do 18 now, not 16, I guess, because we have two cryptocurrencies. Wait, is the 16 part of the? It could well be. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is, it is. It is. Yeah. Now you got me. Okay. Yeah, so we do. We do Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I do. I have, I, I do own Bit, Bitcoin. I do. Um and I just sort of, you know, I bought it, I held it. I really am not trading it really actively. I'm just not. Um, it looks like Bitcoin can go down a little bit more based on the cycle that we're in. Um, we're, we're, we're saying that it's a corrective cycle and it's a complex correction. So it could head lower. Um I'm hoping that, that it doesn't break down below a certain level because I really don't want to see it going back down to the 4,000 mark. But, you know, if we do, I, 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 I'm not going to be extremely optimistic. I mean, I want us to hold, you know, hold. Uh, I don't want us to go down too much further. 
And what got you, what, what I suppose made you think, look, I'm going to add that to, to my portfolio of, uh, of uh, in- instruments? Because our clients were asking for it. This was during the hype. Ah, yes. Okay. Our clients were asking for it. Did, did I want to do it? Absolutely not. <laughs> okay. Am I sorry I did it? Maybe because I mean, a lot of people got burned and I'm sure a lot of our clients got burned because I jumped in. Right. And how did you, I mean, oh, how did you guys, did how did you cope with uh, the that massive run up to 20,000 back a you know, couple of years ago now? Was that just, uh, I mean, cause I'm sure the technicals were probably a little bit, <laughs> you know, overextended at that point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we weren't in favor of, of buying it up there for sure. We thought that was an explosive, you know, elite wave, elite wave move. Um, but we didn't anticipate it going down to 3,500 either. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so what, what do you recommend for somebody who's working a, a day job? I mean, what steps should they take to start earning income trading? Right. So I'm just, so that means that they uh, need to, Start somewhere, start to learn, learn a strategy that they, that they can um, master. And even though they're, they have a day job, at least in the Forex markets, they can come home from work and they can trade the Asian market. So I like to tell traders to start with uh, a demo account and to trade on the smallest time frames just so that they get a lot of uh, price action in and they get a lot of trading in even if they're going to graduate to the bigger time frames because they have a day job. They need to start on the smallest time frames just to get those uh, strategies working for them to see how well they do because the markets are fractal. And what that means is the patterns repeat themselves over and over again, no matter what the time frame, no matter what the market. So they can find the trade setups, the trade patterns on the one minute chart just as easily as they can find them on the four hour chart. By mastering the patterns, and these are Ellie Wave patterns to me, that's how I see the patterns, but they're really tech patterns in classical technical analysis can also be explained um, through Ellie Wave analysis, believe it or not. And that was a big aha moment for me too when I saw the the uh, basic technical analysis patterns in Elliott Wave analysis and the counts themselves. So that's it. That's my advice. Start there, and then hopefully you have the mindset and, and the personality to be able to grow into, because that's what it's about, growing into, taking trades off of the four-hour and the daily charts and finding the same patterns. It's interesting that you um, that you say that, because I think you're probably the first person who's been on the show that's actually said – Go to the smaller time frames and um, use it to practice because I mean most people are like oh, whatever you do don't don't go to the smaller time frames they're too choppy and, and so is it just simply because you find that once you understand Elliott wave you understand price action and the market is fractal and it doesn't matter which you know time frame you're on it, it's going to uh, it's going to play out these Elliott wave pattern, patterns time and time again. Um, is it is that the is that the simple case? Yeah, and I think you're gonna find noise, a lot of noise in like the time frames in the middle. So y- you don't find a lot of noise if you look at the daily or the weekly, and you don't find a lot of noise if you look at the pure Elliott wave patterns on the one minute. Where you find the noise is sort of in between. So you can learn on the smallest time frames to see the, the broader patterns. Yeah. And it's not going to be noisy. It's interesting. Yeah. And so, and you're saying, I mean, the other thing is like talking about graduating to the higher time frames. Uh, whereas, you know, most retail traders will, will jump into the smaller ones and think they've graduated. Uh, that, and that, is that purely for the reason that the gains are, you know, you can get bigger runs and, and make, I suppose, more more pips is that re- is that the reason no because you asked me what if people have day jobs ah oh, right okay so you can graduate to the higher time frames if you've got a day job because you can spend less time in front of the charts is that right yes exactly uh, okay 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 
But there are some traders that can never graduate to that point because they just have the, they don't have the mindset and the personality for it. They just don't like to take losses. They don't, they're impatient. They want to see, you know, just day trade and, and see their profits and then go to the gym and do something else for the rest of the day. They just don't want to hold positions, which is what you're going to have to do if you, if you go to the bigger position, bigger time frames. And do you think that they? Uh, do you think that to to I suppose? I mean, most most people out there are, at, are looking at trading as a way to get rid of their day job. I mean, what would be the steps to to graduate to the higher time frames, and then obviously sort of move from that to to like you know be able to chuck in their day job? Same thing. You want to get consistency. You want to start in the smallest time frames to master your trading strategy and trading system. Then you go to the bigger time frames because you have a day job. And if you do that successfully, well, that's all you need, isn't it? Because then the next step is to fund your account bigger and do the same thing. Nice. Until you can replace your job. Rodeo, so so diving into a price chart, right? If these uh, listeners out there, if they were th- sort of going, okay, all right, what, what should I focus on uh what what would you what would you recommend? Right. So the first thing to understand is price action at when you're when you're learning because you and this brings me back to my you know early days of really learning price action and the way so what you need to what you can put on your charts is like pivot points put on pivot points and. You're just looking at really support and resistance levels. And you will notice that um, that the market definitely hits certain pivot points during the day. It also hits the big figure, the big numbers. Like in Forex, that would be, um, you know, like, like 110, 111 in the euro, for example, right? Um, 109, we haven't gotten there yet, but... So those are called the big numbers. You want to just observe where does the market stop and the pivot points are really good. And the other thing that I like to do that I like to put on my charts is especially for day trading and especially if you're going to practice like we originally started this discussion, practice on the smallest time frames. You want to get five days of charts on your platform, on your screen. So you might look at the 30 minute chart or the 15 minute chart looking at five days and you want to put the high and the low of the previous day today so that you see what the high and the low is from yesterday because the market is they're they're going to you know um use these levels as support and resistance so you set up your chart like that but uh before you start to trade that then you look at the daily and the weekly chart to see where we are in the Elliott Wave count, to see where we are. Are we in a trend or in a sideways price action? And come up with what you think the day range is going to be. And the day range, it, you can get that from the average true range, that indicator, the average true range. And you can use the 100-day or the 20-day. So get the average true range and figure out what the potential movement is in the day for that instrument. By looking at the average true range. Now, in Forex, what I like to do is I I call the beginning of the day 5 o'clock because I'm in the New York time zone. So 5 o'clock is the start of the new day. If the ATR is, let's say, 70 pips for a currency pair, and Europe came in and they already moved the instrument, let's say the currency pair, 70 pips, then... I would come in and say, well, I don't think it's going to move much further in that direction. And I would look to trade the range. Okay. But if, if things were quiet and London was waiting for news coming out of New York and it hadn't moved yet, then I would be already, I mean, after that, that, uh, that news announcement comes out to really to, to see what opportunity arises keeping in mind what the potential is. And, you know, nowadays, average range is like 70 pips. That's about it. 
Yeah, interesting stuff. That's really interesting, actually. It's a, it's a nice way to, to look at it. Uh, right, Jody, we're going to move into the quickfire round. So there's uh, nine questions here. I'm going to whip through them here. Uh, so the first one is, how long did it take you to go from trading newbie to consistently profitable? Well, you know, I was at the bank. I I was profitable. Like I had my training period, of it, like I said, but then I was profitable after that. Like when I was given the British pound to do, that was it. I was profitable from day one. What's your mental approach to trading and do you have any special techniques you can share with us? I think I've already shared um, some stuff about day trading. Um Let's see other techniques. This is like um like I mean, well, I can't edit this stuff out now. Um, this is like uh, like a sort of mindset tricks or like so people stick to their trading plan. Right. So for that, definitely write down your trading strategy, and definitely write down if you're a swing trader, definitely write down your trading plan. So that means write down where your entry and your exit is. And then follow that trading plan and managing your your position. You put it into your platform, but you have to stick with it. You've got to stick with your trading plan. And do you come across many students that don't stick with their trading plan? Yes, of course. And that's where they get into trouble. And because a lot of you know, a lot of traders think, well, they move their stops. They move their stops because they think it's going to eventually go their way. And that's called being stubborn. Um, I have a whole bunch of emotional scenarios in my book. I wrote a book called The Trader's Pendulum, The Ten Habits of Highly Successful Traders. And it's the whole book is, is interwoven with all of these dualities, like between fear and greed. And traders can, can very often get on the fear side and then move to the greed side. Of, so if they're on the fear side, they don't take positions. If we're on the greed, the greed side, they'll move their stop losses until they've just basically crushed their account. So that's a whole other subject, the psychology and moving from fear to greed and staying balanced on that continuum. And the way I stay balanced is to make sure I do my trade plan. Um, I meditate now. I do meditation um, because I need to get my head in shape for this. What's your favorite entry setup? The one, two, three position, like the one, two, three trade. So you decide that the market is going up, let's say. The market moves in the direction up, and then it does a retracement, and then it moves up. And then once it takes out that initial high, that's your entry. It's, it's a way to confirm your view. So you're not getting in uh, until the market moves your way. What strategies do you use to exit or manage active trades? Actually, we'll skip that one because you've already answered it. Uh, the three profiteers, yeah. <laughs> what's your fav- uh, What's your recommended trading book? The Trader's Pendulum, The Ten Habits of Highly Successful Traders by Jody Samuels. If there was uh, one thing you'd recommend any retail trader spend the next month mastering, what would it be, why, and how could they go about mastering it? Master uh, price action and support and resistance. Price action. How can they go about just, again, by following the markets and really understand the price action on the currency pair or stock or futures market or index that you're trading? Whatever it is, really focus on that until you understand how it trades because there are, you know, different, like, different seasonality components there are different like some of these markets are well volume is really important so you just need to focus on the market that you want to learn and master it master the price action what's your preferred broker and trading platform well i don't know if i have a preferred but i use oanda i like oanda what's the worst trade you've ever had yeah uh, I don't really, um, I'm not going to tell you about it because it was at the bank. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. They okay. probably don't want to know about it either. Um, yeah. <laughs> if, if you could leave our listeners with one piece of advice, what would it be? 
if I could leave what? If you could leave our listeners with one piece of advice, what would it be? Master your, to master yourself and to develop confidence in yourself as a trader, um, really work on yourself. Uh, try, try some meditation um, and really, like, trading is about mastering yourself, mastering your, your mind, really, so that you can continue to take trades and not be affected by the trades where the winners and the losers feel the same to you. That's where you want to. That's where you want to strive for. That's what you want to strive for. Great. Right. Look, this is the last question of the show, and you've sort of answered it across the course of the show, but it would be probably quite nice to to get you to to summarize the whole thing uh, in in one fell swoop. So this is uh, we'd like you to give us the bones of a of a trading strategy, the entry setup, stop loss, take profit targets, market time frame, something our listeners can have a bit of a play with at home this week. Okay, so let's quickly do the one, two, three strategy. Um, all Elliott waves move in either three waves or five waves. So that by deduction means that all moves at least move in three waves, even if they don't continue on to five waves. So this is called the equality trade where the market moves up. Let's just say or moves down, but let's just say, say it moves up. And then it corrects a certain Fibonacci percentage, percentage. And then the projection would be that third leg up equidistant to the first leg up. So that's called the equality trade. That's what you can you can um, look for. And you would take the trade once the market moves above that the high of the first leg. And your profit target, easy, it's going to be 100% of the length of the first leg. So that's where you can start. And you will find these over and over again on any market, in any time frame. Have fun with it. Nice. Brilliant. Well, look, thank you very much for coming on the show, Jody. Now, what's the best way for listeners to get hold of you? Jody, J-O-D-Y, at fxtradersedge.com. Brilliant. Well, look, a big thank you to Jody for sharing with us today. Everything we've discussed here, along with all the links, are in the show notes. To find them, simply search for Jody in the search box on tradingnut.com. Until next time, I wish all my listeners trading happiness and success. Righty ho, folks. Hope you enjoyed that interview with Jody. Now, uh, before I let you go, a couple of things. One is, if you're looking to get funded trading to trading forex, if you've got a bit of capital, you don't even have to have a lot. I mean, fifty bucks, twenty bucks, I think, can get you started on some of these programs. Uh, head over to tradingnut.com forward slash funding, or I think there will be links in the show description on your podcast app or in the navigation on tradingnut.com. Now, there's that. There's the Robot Traders Club and Robot Builders Club. So if you want to automate some of your trading, automate what you're doing, then you can either join the Builders Club, learn to build them yourself, and just start experimenting with strategies, uh, building them. I know the no-nonsense Forex stuff definitely works with this approach. So if you want to speed up your testing with that, uh, there or there's the Robot Traders Club where we're working as a community. I'm building the robots we're based on strategies suggested by members and we're seeing how they work. If they work, we're going to try and find one that can sustain us going forward in the market. So there's those few options there, guys. And also, last but not least, I'm doing the uh, I'm doing the Ninja Trading Challenge at the moment through another outfit, Tribe of Traders, who put together this free 14 day uh, challenge. And I'm day three into it. I've got to say, it's really good stuff. So if you've got, if you if you have, or if you think. Well, maybe even if you don't think you've got issues with your money mindset that could be holding back your trading, then I do recommend heading over there. It's episode 53, so go and check that one out. Um, there'll be links there to get into the challenge. It started three days ago for me. Now, by the time you're listening to this, it'll be a week into it if you listen on the day this gets launched. Uh, otherwise, I do recommend just signing up anyway. I'm sure they'll run it again. If not, you might be able to get fast-tracked through it as well. So guys, go and check that out. On top of the other two things, a lot to do. Links in the show notes, uh, show description. Check them all out. And I'll see you on next week's episode.